Hey guys. Hey. <laughs> Welcome to Dango Thoughts. Thanks for having us. Uh, we're going to give some context in a second, but um, I deeply appreciate you guys suggesting to do this because I wouldn't think to do this, and I think it's actually a great idea. Uh, to give just a little bit of context, um, I was on your guys' podcast, which obviously I'm going to put on the, uh, in the link in the description. Uh, it's called Soma. Uh, it's something of Modern Awakening. Stories Remember? of Modern Awakening. What is it? Stories? Stories of Modern Awakening. Stories of Modern Awakening. And uh, it was revolving around my discovery with the... DMT thing with the laser and um, you, you guys uh, wanted to see what I was talking about and we did that and then you suggested that you are willing and open to come and talk about it openly which is great and I guess maybe in my mind the reason I didn't think of doing this is because I don't know something told me that you know not everybody wants to do be public about it yeah, not everybody wants to be public about it, and therefore, I guess somehow I assumed that who, whomever wants to talk about it would just kind of tell me, which you guys did. But I think it opened the window of understanding for me that maybe I should ask certain people because I'm sure that some people would want to be talking about it. Mm -hmm. I had one guest, Alan, who talked about it briefly. Uh, he's very, he got very intrigued, and he wanted to talk about it as well. But aside from that, I didn't really think of it like in like structural terms. So thank you for being here. Thank you for offering. Yeah. Uh, and um, and I want to start by we don't we we're a little bit short on time today, so we're gonna try and keep it. You know, we're gonna I, I'm gonna have to okay. challenge myself to focus <laughs> and like go on along a very structured path. Uh, but first, before we talk about anything else, I want to I want you guys both to tell me shortly uh, about yourself a little bit, and then about the podcast your version of it so who's gonna start Aaron you want to start um sure yeah so I, I've been uh kind of exploring for the past 20 years or so uh and I had what I can only call an awakening experience uh after doing MDMA for the first time and there was kind of a lot of build up to it like I was researching a lot and reading a lot about mm, metaphysics uh spirituality quantum mechanics all this kind of stuff uh, but the MDMA experience kind of took me to this place where I felt uh, chi energy for the first time. And it just kind of like really opened up uh, my understanding of myself and my understanding of the world and got me very much into this path of wanting to know more how to work with this stuff. And so the podcast is kind of the reflection of that, like stories of people that are having awakenings um, in maybe not the traditional ways, the traditional spiritual like meditative ways, like using substances or through sexual experiences um, and just understanding how that works and what the value is and, and how we can integrate those things into our, into our lives. So, so you're just, saying you were interested in the actual mechanisms, if we can discover them. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's been the focus of it is like uh, not just to take a drug for the purpose of, like having a fun experience, but really to understand what the mechanisms are that give people access to discover more about themselves and more about the world. Can I ask you a technical question that I don't necessarily know if you have the answer to, but it would be interesting to see if maybe you do. Uh, you said it, you felt chi for the first time. Mm -hmm. My question was always, does it feel different than just, what is the difference between feeling chi and feeling regular proprioception? Yeah. Like, do, do you know what I'm asking? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the thing is, I think people experience it all the time, but we don't really have a, a way to place it because, um, yeah, there's stuff that you feel like in your body. There's just feeling of emotions and stuff like that. But for me, it was so it was so obvious that there was something going on. Like I was I was at a like outdoor rave kind of thing. So there are a bunch of people dancing and I walked out on the dance floor and literally like moving my hand, like someone, someone passed by me and I held my hand out and it was like a feeling of like, like taffy, like actually pulling something. So it was like being in that So you space. felt texture. Yeah. Yeah. That, like, that like had actual, something to do with the external world. Actual basically. like tangible kind of feeling like you're, you're pulling or pushing something. And that, that's, that's the difference and where, uh, I can go and where I can sometimes take people is to the place where there, there's no doubt anymore. It, it's kind of like, yeah, maybe I'm feeling something. If you're like in a yoga class or a Qigong class, you're like, oh, am I feeling something? Maybe I'm not. Like this is just like there's no doubt that there's something there that's independent of you that you're tapping into and feeling like tangibly. So, 
Amazing. Uh, Rachel, what about you personally? And then we'll get into the podcast after that. Yeah. So Aaron's introduction uh, was through uh, that MDMA experience. Um, mine was just sort of developing and deepening awareness through meditation for uh, a, a period of time. I actually got like really serious about meditation. I think a lot of us sort of like even evangelize after we start meditating because it is so transformative. Um, so that's, that's really the territory that I started to explore and like wanted to map for myself that, uh, those states of consciousness, uh, the Jonic states, like that was something that I was really interested in, uh, sort of breaking down and understanding the structure of. Um, and then I also, um, am in the process of studying what's happening neurologically, um, studying cognitive science. So, um, yeah, that's that was sort of my in. Um, and then I had been developing awareness and eventually was introduced to these concepts through Aaron. Um, and like I immediately just sort of intuitively understood that like this is an independent reality and I want to like sort of advance the effort to to create those maps and allow other people to access them too. Um, and so um yeah, and then we decided that with the podcast, like a lot of a lot of the learning just happens through processing and through integrating and through conversation. And so we wanted to invite people into those spaces where we're exploring and finding language that sort of matches up with that experience. Um, and and wanted to invite other people's to come, other people guests to come on and do that for themselves too, and then help them sort of parse them out and maybe um, I don't know support them with new language or. Uh, concepts that maybe were familiar unfamiliar before so from yeah it seems like from what i've gathered so far i've actually listened to almost all of your episodes uh not the last one but almost all of them and uh the common thread that i'm seeing is that you're basically creating a space for people who have those experiences or lifestyles that uh, are around those experiences mm -hmm. and you're creating a space for them to express that in a way that is not you're trying to decouple it a little bit from what people perceive as the woo, woo Like you're try actually trying to like talk about things in a manner that is in between the 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 woo woo rhetoric. And what I mean by that is that the people who have too much, uh, they're too breathy. You know what I mean? They're just like, uh, like yeah, okay, I okay. Um, but and then there's the other side which is very rigid. Right, mm -hmm. so this, you guys, I almost feel like play this middle ground in between those two, which is like you, you, those experiences are real. We want to talk about them for what they are, which is like you said, uh, uh, a real reality that is out there, and we need to learn how to talk about it in a way that is more coherent, but at the same time not dismissive. And uh, that's how I perceive what you guys are doing, and I think it's actually a, a great that that it's definitely something that is. Uh, very needed and um, uh, for example you know w what I'm doing now is something that uh, I'm very biased in that regard because I definitely need more of that kind of language and this is something that develops as I go along just like you guys are doing um, what is it about for you what is it what is the podcast about for you Aaron specifically uh, well I mean I was thinking as you as you were talking that there's sort of the, yeah, the those two sides where I think people often get to this point where they have some kind of a an experience and then they seek out spirituality um, because of the experience that they had. But these traditional ways of spirituality, they, they don't incorporate some of these things that we do <laughs> with uh, our normal lives. Um, so, you know, my experience is like going to martial arts and going to different like meditation practices. It's like you don't use drugs, right? Because they're sort of like, counter intuitive to the process like, it's like taboo you're not supposed to be using yeah. any which, yeah. which which if you really think about it it's got i mean to cut you off but that's a really uh, a sticking point for me which is it's those this closed-mindedness of like this puritist uh approach which is like you're not supposed to use any helpers it was like mm -hmm. you use helpers all the time if you use gi in brazilian jiu-jitsu that's a tool you're using mm -hmm. it's an ex it's an external tool for you but for some reason when it comes to the mind and augmenting your mind we think that whatever tools we need, we already come with them, mm. which, which to me, that's just, you know, why would that be the case? Right, or, or it's somehow like wrong to find these shortcuts. And, and this is like where, where I diverged in the way that I 
like to teach people like even just energy work for example because the traditional way of teaching energy work is like okay you stand in this position for a hundred days and then maybe you'll feel something and i'm like like screw that i want my students to be able to feel something like day one day two right so if i can give someone like you know it's kind of like this idea of like the red pill blue pill kind of thing like if i can give someone something and it gives them access to that space for even just like 10 minutes, right? So they know there's a there there. Yeah, then, then, then yeah. you know what it is. Why, why am I doing all this stuff? Like, why am I spending all this time standing around? Because I know that there's something that I can get to and I have like a vision and a perspective of where that is. And when I'm approaching it, I, I kind of know. So I, I, part of the podcast is like wanting to teach people that there are these tools, but that can be used skillfully and responsibly in order to progress along that spiritual path much faster, I believe, than kind of like the traditional model, maybe you could say. Yeah, no, I'm I'm 100% on board with this. And this is actually a great entry point into what we wanted to talk about, because I believe that this whole space of uh, the inner exploration suffers from um, either over, like too much openness or short-sightedness, like very myopic kind of approach to it. So, and the two are one side just married to the concept fully and is not willing to question it mm -hmm. in like a rigorous way, which is like, you know, the people that you tell them, you talk to them about spirits and gods and they nod their heads as if that's an obvious thing. They're like, yeah, like, what do you mean? Yeah, like, that's not an <laughs> obvious thing. Like, what do you mean? Yeah, like, where are you coming from? And then, and then the other side, which is completely close to it, obviously, right? Which is like, no, it's all mind-made. Uh, and I think that there's the important thing to reframe, at least for me it is, which is the main driver in all of the human endeavor is knowledge. Mm -hmm. It's not the things we build externally to ourselves. All of those things, they um, it rests on knowing how things work and why. So we can't go to space just with our bodies, right? We have to build things to go to space. But the main driver there is knowledge. It's like understanding things about physics, about engineering, about what works and what doesn't and why, and then testing them, right? And I don't think that this domain of exploration is any different. I think that our mind is has certain prereq like there, there there's certain parameters that we're born with, right? And different people have maybe. Uh, more openness towards this thing or more op or the ability to do this better. But in the end of the day, we're all working within a framework that we can't really get outside of because of the nature of how it's structured at the moment. And if we, if we engage with it in a way that we understand and we understand the structure, just like going to space, um, then we slowly can start build internal vehicles and even external vehicles that attend to the internal vehicles mm -hmm. that help us do things more reliably and then understand things more decisively. Right. So for example, this big question of like, you know, when you smoke DMT, is that space real or not real? Well, it's a difficult question because it rests a lot on people's uh, a priori assumptions about it. Like if you come from a f purely physicalist perspective, then it's going to be very difficult to convince you that it's anything outside of the mind because you have to allow for that for a second just to be able to see that maybe this is a, more uh, accurate modality to operate under and then the pushback you get is like well how do you then differentiate between just you, the fluff that comes out of your mind and whatever you think is the real space is mm -hmm. good question but we should ask it and we should talk about it and we should develop real conceptual tools to actually break down the differences and this is a this is a point that we you and i had during the podcast i did with you guys which is you said that what i found um, uh, has its own reality, right? And the fact that it was replicable was the thing that had the biggest impact for you. Mm -hmm. And you said that in your work, there's certain elements that you can replicate with people, which is like certain feelings or certain emotions have a very particular kind of texture and color and feel. And most people can agree on those things. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of hard to formulate because we're all just talking about it, right? And I think that's... The way that I view the, the, the project that we're about to embark into in the 21st century, which is the inner exploration in a, in a rigorous way, where we understand those, those uh, uh, structures, would 
the biggest challenge will be to reframe this for other people in a way that they see that no, like there are real things here and we just have to figure out how to talk about them in a way that will allow us to engage with them in a more coherent mm -hmm. sense. So let me, in the service of, you know, the, the fact that we don't have a lot of time, let me just <laughs> kind of dive into it. To anybody who doesn't know, about three and a half years ago, I'm going to try and summarize it in two minutes. And if anybody's interested, they can go and watch you know, the rest of the stuff that I put out regarding this. Um, but essentially, I discovered that when you project a 650 nanometer refracted laser on a wall, and you smoke DMT, you see a structure. You see digits, you see a structure that is very coherent. It seems like digital, a digital clock. Uh, as you very brilliantly put it, um, it looks like looking through a microscope, which I think is actually the closest to what uh, it, it would deliver the, the point closest to people who never done it or maybe never will do it but essentially then the challenge became like okay how like how we're replicating this and i started showing this to people and then other people saw it and a lot of people saw it and then uh we got to a point where you know now some scientists got that got interested and now my question is uh, some very specific from a personal point of view um, it's kind of difficult for me to completely remove myself, but I'll try as much as I can. When you guys wanted to see it and you came for the first time, if you can talk a little bit about your general impression of the whole thing, bef the whole thing before you saw it, and then during the time that you saw it, and then what was your impression after? And you can talk about it like very, very honestly and objectively. Feel free to express that because I think that's a very important uh, data point. We can start with you, Aaron, or... Yeah, well, I was going to say it, it was kind of funny because we were, we were joking a little bit, or maybe I was joking, I won't, I won't put it on you, that like, uh, th here's this like crazy guy, he's got this video, he's talking about this like other universe simulation thing, and it's just like, is this guy like a little bit, a little bit cuckoo, <laughs> or <laughs> is he like really onto something, you know, and, and that was the thing is that, um, you know, because you were referred to us by someone we knew, and because he said like this guy is actually kind of like doing this from a scientific perspective. It was like, okay, yeah, let, let's, let's like see what's here, you know, um, and see if there's actually something to it. So I, I think the challenging thing for me, just from personal, uh, perspective of coming into this is that I had never done DMT before. So it was sort of like putting me into this space where I was trying to experience something without really knowing what the substance was like, uh, before, uh, you know, I hadn't had any experience with yeah, it Yeah, you before. had no point of context. Yeah, and that's actually something that that I, I kind of understand from my work because when I take people on like a guided journey, I'm taking them to a very specific place and I almost like don't wanna have that be their first experience on the substance because it's like, you know, go out, explore, know what it's like, and then I'll show you this really cool thing that you can access. Um, but yeah, after we did it the first time, I kind of got a sense that there was there was really something there. I didn't see like I mean, this is like we're, we're recording like a few minutes after, after we did it the we, second we time. We did yeah. it a second time, and I was able to to see more and understand like what it is that I was looking at. But yeah, it, again, it's not something that where it's like it's not something where it's like, oh my God, I learned this like amazing thing about myself and it's like a life-changing experience, but it's like, yes, there's obviously something that's going on here. And yeah, what Rachel says about looking at a microscope, it's like th there's something that's happening, some like physical, metaphysical phenomenon that's worth exploring. Thank you. And I, and I appreciate your comments and honesty because I, to be honest, again, one of my biggest struggles is that I am coming to it from a very scientific point of view uh, which is to discover what's actually there. Mm -hmm. And because if I wouldn't see it myself, I would have a very similar attitude to what you've had if I would be hearing this about someone else. Uh, I, I honestly don't know if I would even bring myself to kind of like open up and listen. Maybe if there would be like an individual buffer, like yeah. a buffer individual who would tell me like, you know, so that, so thank you, Scott, that, that probably helped a lot. Um, but yeah, that, that's the thing that I'm still struggling with a lot because... I know what it must come across as, which which makes it very uh, just making sure it's recording. Uh, that uh, that comes across very a little bit out there, and uh, the fact that you you guys were open enough and brought me on your podcast without knowing too much beyond that, um, I'm very grateful for that. And also, what you said just now is very helpful because it your account in particular made me realize this that. It, 
I guess it should have been obvious, but it wasn't to me, that when people enter the DMT space, that's already so radically different than what people usually experience right. that then to also tell them, oh, but there's also another layer here, they won't be able to probably differentiate between what you're telling them that the new layer is and the general thing that is already different for them. Mm -hmm. So I think that's actually very helpful. And I think moving forward, I will try and focus on having people like do the exploration, do the thing, maybe even come back on another day and then just so they can actually see the granularity, see the differences yep. there. I think that's very, very helpful. So Rachel, what about you? What, what was your impression before? What was your impression doing, doing and after? Yeah. Um, so first, I actually want to uh, go back to the uh, microscope analogy. Um, that language actually comes from Rick Strassman, Dr. Rick Strassman, uh, who talks about the DMT experience as being a, a sort of like uh, a microscope or... Um, yeah, I guess a, a microscope into uh, a, a reality that exists within our own, but it, that is purely accessible through a certain like tool. Um, and I think uh, that language is being applied to sort of the DMT state in general, um, right? Like there is a there is a independent reality that is sort of occurring, um, maybe consistently with our reality or. Um, Co cohesive within our reality, but that we can only access in that state. Uh, when I use the, the micro, uh, sorry, microscope analogy, um, and looking at the, uh, the characters, like it's literally like looking into a microscope, um, and on a very like sort of not, um, not metaphorical level. Like it really feels yeah. like you're looking. And, and in, I think that's the difference. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and by I the way, Doc, uh, Dr. Rick Strassman was on your guys' podcast, yes. right? It was yes. an episode right after me. Two episodes two right episodes. after me because of both of them. Yeah. Uh, which, that's incredible for a new podcast to score uh, a, as big of a name as uh, Dr. Rick Strassman. <laughs> that's incredible. Um, but say a little bit more about the just your perception before. I think the reason it, it's an yeah, important yeah. data point I just wanted to, to, to make that disclaimer, but um, yeah. yeah. No, and by, actually, to that, so I won't forget later, it, it, to be honest... I later read his second book, uh, Souls of Prophecy. What is it? DMT, the Soul of Prophecy. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, I read that thing in there. The thing is that I've had so much experience with DMT before, it never felt to me like a microscope. Mm -hmm. Like, it, it felt like, yeah, it feels real, but it never felt like a microscope. So I, I guess this is the first time that I can say that it actually felt like that. And it, But you made the distinction perfectly. You said that this maybe was meant to be used a little bit more metaphorically. A little more and this abstractly, didn't, I think. This doesn't feel metaphorical. This right. actually feels... Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's literally like that same... It's the same like eye movement almost of like having to peer into something. But we'll get to that after. Sure. Um, yeah, this was my... That was my first experience with DMT. And I've, obviously like I've done... I've done my homework. Like I read The Soul of Prophecy. I read DMT, The Spirit Molecule. Um, and like I was very interested in the idea of, of something that feels realer than real. Like how... Because I'm, I'm sort of like... I mean, like most people, like I'm just very attached to my to my physical safety and like and feeling grounded and and the idea that like reality is uh, is mostly unchanging and you know it doesn't change until it does. Like that's how I that's how I draw my sense of security in the world and the idea that there is a reality that is more real than the reality that I'm you know experiencing in my day to day life was a very sort of interesting novel idea to me um and so i was studying it sort of abstractly i was reading books about it but i never had the chance to experience it um and so on one level i just mostly wanted to experience dmt for the first time i you know like i didn't have any um it wasn't a goal to to experience the characters i figured if it's real great if not like it's cool i had a dmt experience and we also had the the context of 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 like knowing you through scott who was another uh, Scott Weinberg was another guest on our podcast. And so I had that context. Um, and then you came on the podcast and you knew what you were talking about. Like you could very distinctly point to what what that was. You had a sort of uh, philosophical idea about about what it was, how it built the structure of reality and the story of how you were even called to use that uh, that laser like was just like very sort of like okay like there's there's substance here like this isn't just an, a sort of idea that was pulled out of the air so that I was I was kind of interested to begin with um and so yeah and so I was excited to come here and have that first DMT experience um and we did and then the time came to go and look at the laser and um it just I think for me it was pretty quick 
Like I, I yeah, you were I very quick with that. Yeah. I mean, my eye just sort of like adjusted. And when I saw it, it was like, it was surprising, but it wasn't as like, it didn't like shift my perception of reality in the way that I thought maybe it would. It was just kind of like, oh yeah, okay. This is like, like the, this is the way like the world is. Like we're just literally built out of numbers and codes and, um, it, they contribute to the, to the level of reality that we exist on. And for whatever reason. So you already had some kind of a frame that was very much along those lines and they just basically just kind of verified it for you in a sense. Yeah. And I think all of, I think many people sort of have this sense that like reality is constructed of a material that's not, I mean like molecules, right? Like molecular structures, like they're, they're their own, like they have their own structures. Like you can, you can observe them independently. Um, so we already have experience with that. So to see that on another level is not so shocking. I'm curious, um, is if we could like isolate like molecular structures and see the code within that, that would, that would be really That's interesting. That's an interesting thought to just kind of project it into that world. I think that there's going to be the second that it's going to become more of a, maybe not mainstream because it's going to take quite a while, but maybe a, a stage in which more of the real science accepts that there's a way to do this in a reliable way, then I think there's going to be a whole new field of exploration in general of uh, cos- cosmology, uh, biology, like all the fields that you can basically observe things, right? I think they will, it will open up to that, that you might need to be able, you not, might need to be on DMT and doing this very particular thing with either light or maybe other components that we're going to discover as we go along. And then use that to discover a new layer. Because the way that I see it, it's it's the first time that we, we realize that there's something about the mind that is intrinsic to reality. Which, to people who are already on a spiritual path, that's a duh. That's a, like a obviously, right? But it's not a duh to the larger scope of science. It's actually, for most scientists... Um, again, anybody who comes to the world from a physicalist perspective, which is most of scientists... Mm-hmm. It's everything should be able to be explained in terms of of atoms and, and um, wave functions, basically, from the quantum world. And I think this is the first time that we have a glimmer of, of a potential understanding that, no, 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 a mind, I mean, you can call it an arising property of the brain, but you still have to address of exactly what is it about the physical matter that gives rise to, 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 which is the hard problem of consciousness. And I think this is the first time you can see there's a connection between what we see from our internal world that, at least in the moment, I can't see, I can't see any way in which like a, an actual recording device can capture this, right? So it's a problem, right. but this is something that will have to be addressed and over, we're going to have to overcome this problem somehow. Again, maybe it's like... I always, I keep saying maybe it's like some version of Neuralink that allows you to just record the experience. Yeah, I was um, just gonna say that. <laughs> but the what? I was just gonna say that I was like wait wait around until Neuralink comes. Ho- around hopefully, then... even though I have some friends who are like in the field that they keep telling me like, you guys misunderstand Neuralink. It's never gonna be oh, that. Okay. I'm like, never say never. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, but but I think that until that day comes, the tools we're gonna have in our disposal are conversation and i think this is an interesting pivotal moment in history the way that i view it because i'm a big believer in human conversation and it is true that humans are also prone to self-deception and that's why science is such a powerful tool because it overrides our self-deception but the idea that all perception is not valid until it's verified by like a million other external uh, uh, tools and uh, other observations, I think that is bunk. I think that's actually absolutely not true because an example that I gave on your podcast, which is like we measure things in neuroscience, but we rely fully on people's accounts of what it feels like to be in that state when that signature is present. So in the same way, I do feel that, yes, it is absolutely true, tr- true to say that this kind of a way to go about it, which is like, you know, we... we ingest this substance and then we look at a laser and then we talk about it that's never going to be enough to establish it so we can like rigorously study it but i would say it is definitely enough if you take into account the types of people who you engage with on this so for example there's a difference between somebody who again you know the overly 
spiritual person who just like wants this the confirmational bias there is just like insane right so when you talk to that person it's going to be harder to get any information that is of of value because you know that there's going to be a lot of things inside of them that they would want to verify this versus actually be skeptical about it as they're looking at but if you get you know a lot of scientists who would actually come into this like very skeptical but open-minded which is very important because you can always explain things away uh i think then we can start creating a language of our conversation that is more, is closer to truth and we can extract things from this experience for people that actually correlates to real things and then we can use that information to try and come up with like experiments that would probe into the space from a physical standpoint because it has to have a connection some kind of a connection from a physical standpoint um so anyways that's kind of like my little rant on what i think is the, the biggest challenge which is the the human conversation and what distinguishes between bullshit and not bullshit with people who are coming into this like you guys for example yes you open to the spiritual world but like you said like in the beginning you 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 guys even open your podcast with like a very skeptical vibe and then it changes towards the end but that was also because you guys are also open skeptical but open and i think that when people are not open you can look at the same phenomena and you can just explain it away you can just basically you know shove it under the rug and one of the biggest things that i hear a lot from the people that that it seems like they're resisting it is that even I actually had one that replicated it but then the, he had a completely different conclusion about it it was very bitter like I could hear it in the in his tone the, the way he was texting and I was like okay well I'll, I mean I'll register your opinion as as a data point for sure it's important but I would just I would just invite you and challenge you because the the idea was like no you know like I see all those things I see what you're talking about and it doesn't convince me at all I'm like mm. okay but you're seeing what I'm talking about it's like yeah I'm like okay well then now we have to talk about what this means yeah you're arguing like, the significance not the existence of 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 the code yeah 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 it's what it actually go ahead sorry right no I mean I think I think you were kind of touching on this point earlier but I think intention also like going into the experience like if you're going into the intention with if you're going to the, into the experience with the intention of disproving it like you're ultimately going to have an experience that verifies that for you or if you're like you said like you know if an overly spiritual person comes to this experience like wanting to find god in that code like they will find god in that code um but with your intention and i think for our intention and and hopefully for for you know the intention of of the scientific world at large is like finding truth and you can't be honest with yourself if you're if you're uh um your intention is just to 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 sort of like debunk. There's a difference between wanting to debunk something and wanting to truly understand. Sure, it. but it's more about it's. I think I think on a level, it's like asserting a certain dominance over reality. Like you mm. want to be the the person who can who ultimately has the ability to distinguish, uh, uh, you know, fraudulence from from truth. And or or like you're you like to be the one to say like uh, no I know exactly um, <laughs> what you mean you 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 like to be the person who has the final word in such a way that basically it's like oh you silly goose like you, you dummy like you yeah, think of this thing. Verifies, let me show you how you're wrong stability basically. and like and 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 um you actually had such beautiful language for this you said you went into a ceremony recently with a certain intention what was the intention for your ceremony uh, you let did? go of false certainties yeah let go of false certainties so. You're, you know, if you're coming in with a certainty um, around like, you know, this person constructed this idea and it's like a bunch of and it's a bunch of bullshit and like I'm going in to to assert that like you're going to have a, an experience that verifies that. Um, and yeah. And, and so I think what we're doing here is we're just we're just trying to find truth um, and and being humble and having a sort of like purity of 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 consciousness that's not sort of pulling in either direction is what's going to get us there um and i think i think agendas are might get in the way like i think that there are certain agendas within um i don't know maybe um yeah i mean i guess it's i guess agendas and prohibition or agendas against you know like mind altering substances in general because there's a lot of fear attached to those spaces that may get in the way of this sort of exploration which is really sad but i hope that the more conversations that we have and the more honesty we have um the less you know 
uh, victory those agendas will have over the progression of science. And, well, it's uh, just it's just more taboo in in a lot of worlds. You wanted to say something. Yeah, I, I just like the idea of kind of like bringing science science into the spiritual space because I think um, what a lot of people's experiences with spirituality and meditation, it's like you are trying to get closer to God or something like this. And with the work that I do with energy, it's gotten to the point where it's like, you know, at first it was like really magical and it's like, oh, wow, what is this thing I'm tapping into? Am I becoming enlightened? Da, da, da. And now it's just like, okay, I know this stuff exists. Like there's a substance here. I can't measure it with, you know, the, the tools that scientists use, but it's just sort of like, this is how people are constructed. There's this thing that interfaces between the body and the mind and there's some information there and I can work with it. So it's, it's not like, like by studying it, it becomes a little bit more mundane and it's just something that you observe and you know how to work with. Yeah. And I think the biggest thing again is, is we talk about false certainties. I've noted that, you know, this is a very large point, so I'm going to try and keep it down to like five minutes. Um, but basically the false certainties that I see many times in science is sometimes greater than the the false certainties that I see in religious people, at least with religious people or spiritual people that are, again, a little bit too far afield for me to actually communicate in a coherent way. But at least there, there's no attempt to hide the fact that you have that certainty. I believe, I think that with a lot of scientists, the problem is that they have this virtue signaling way of talking about things in which, you know, if something would come and it would completely disprove what I'm saying, then I would just let go of it in a heartbeat. Like, okay, here's a thing for you to look at. <laughs> oh, no, but this can't be because of A, B, C, D, and G. I'm like, okay, so no, then. Uh, the, the idea is that, you know, sometimes things are expressed in science as a whole, not even just by individual scientists. Like, this belief that a lot of physicists have, like, we're almost there. I'm like, really? Why would you think that? Why would you think that the entire history of the universe, not only that you would think that you're alone in this entire universe, but also you would think that you, not just in your lifetime, but you, you specifically, in your entire, in the entire existence of everything, all of a sudden, there's going to be a moment in your lifetime in which you will figure it all out. What are the chances of that? Just from statistical analysis, right? Like, if that's not false certainty, I don't know what is. The other thing that I hear a lot is, because, um, okay, so there's those examples that are very obvious, but I don't know how they're not more obvious. So, for example, in a, cert a certain period from now, I don't remember the exact uh, number of years, but there will be a time in the universe in which even the closest galaxies to us will recede from us so far because the edges of the universe recede from us faster than the speed of light, which means there are certain regions of the universe that are forever outside of our ability to interact with. So eventually, there will be there will be, will be a point in which all the neighboring galaxies will be outside of the reach of being able to observe them. Mm. Now, does that mean that those galaxies don't exist? Mm. No. But scientists know, and this is not a like a hidden fact; it's a fact that. Any, any civilization is going to live in that time, unless they had like tools of recording all of that forever, right? They won't know that those... If we would develop our, our technologies now in that time, then we would think that our galaxy is the entire universe. Mm -hmm. Simple, right? So just by the happenstance of your appearing in history, you would have certain access to certain things and not to other things. But you know that now those things exist, and yet you know that in the future they will not be available. So what makes you think that that's not the situation right now? What makes you think there's no regions of space or existence that you simply don't have access to because of your appearing in a particular point in time in the, exist in the existence's life, right? So the, those things kind of drive me crazy when, when, you know, when expressed with too much certainty. Um, and the thing for me is that the other the other side of this is like when people resist and they say, well, it's just mind made. I'm like, okay, what do you mean by just mind made? Because you don't know how your mind makes it anyways, right? So we have, that's a discussion we should have. We should have a conversation about what do you mean by just mind made? And then it will lead us to a more rigorous conversation about why this is different than what you think is just mind made and how the world is being constructed. So anyways, that's, uh, that's, my, that's my little you know, five cents on what I, the things that drive me a little crazy when I, when I hear those false certainties. Um, 
I want to hear from you guys before we we're gonna have to probably wrap up in like 10 minutes um, it's actually a question that uh, it, I've known you guys now for a few months and I know that you both actually came I don't know to what extent it's relevant but I'm just kind of painting a timeline here you both came from is is it for both of you an Orthodox Jewish tradition kind of thing or slightly different uh, I mean I grew up conservative but I went to Orthodox school so I was kind of exposed to everything okay and and what about you Rachel yeah I'm not an Orthodoxy okay all of time <laughs> and and I know that you actually we talked about this you know uh, off camera you have a little bit of the struggle of like letting go of some of those things, even though you're trying to maintain this very modern perception of the world. But you feel that there's still components in those beliefs that serve uh, a greater good in a way that is hard to replace, let's say, right? So it's like there's something about it that you feel that should not be fully dropped. I mean, I think for me, there's a certain, there's a role. No, no, and I'm, uh, by the way, I'm not saying it like to put you in, in like no, you know, no, no, in the no, spot no. on the spot. I'm I'm genuinely interested in. No, I, I love I love to talk about it. I think it's like I think it's like what I have to add to the space. Um, hmm. What would that be, if I can? What what the what the what from the all the things is? in the Jewish tradition? What, what, would there be like particular components that you feel that they're hard to replace, and maybe mm. we should not discard them? Well, I think if there are systems that are resonant for me more within Judaism than, than anywhere else. And I think, I think it's almost purely because I grew up with it. And for me to discount that would be sort of inauthentic. Um, but yes, like if I look at the chakra system, there are many sort of, uh, it's very aligned within the Kabbalistic system of, of Sfirot and like, it's, it just, it just, for whatever reason, that language lands for me. Um, and I think also like in experiencing my own sort of like mystical states that were achieved through like deep meditation, like a, a lot of what is written in those in those sort of mystical texts coming from Safed and from um, sort of uh, Sephardic Jewry and, in, 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 you know, I don't know, 16th or 15th century France, like that language is very much aligned with like what I was you know, experiencing in my bedroom at 16, you know, meditating for long periods of time and fasting and then incorporating certain elements of liturgy. Um, and to feel like seen in that way and to feel like, you know, there is, there is like a verification of experience, like was very valuable to me. Um, and so, yeah, it's like hard for me to let go of that. I also think that like some people read Rumi and that, you know, that resonates for them in a, in a very, strong kind of way like all right like I read Song of Songs and and that's the experience that I have and I don't think that it's sort of like inherently or independently um more powerful than other you know other mystical texts or other mystical other ways in uh for some people it's it's you know like holotropic breath work or it's uh you know like it's toning and it's so it's about it's it's about the experience it's about what kind of feeling you get because at the end of the day, like, and and this is sort of like d- divorced from this conversation because we're we're talking mostly on a on a scientific level, and and I don't think there is that much of a spiritual uh, sort of dimension to to what we're talking about here. I think it's very scientific, and I think that that to sort of like try to incorporate a spiritual religious element to it would just sort of like muck it up and you're talking about this particular conversation we're having right now yeah yeah yeah. i don't know if that's necessarily the case okay uh, we're gonna because we, we we'll be running out of time and i want aaron to yes. give me his final word as well i will only say that in actually in the ceremony that you mentioned that i did recently um i one of the biggest things that i was exposed to was the importance of framing things a certain way you can't just beat the nuts and bolts like it has to incorporate the dimension of the conversation that allows you to also feel and experience something on a I deeper level. I think it's different. I think that is true. I don't think that when I when I talk about like my Judaism, you know, like be sort of being incorporated into my spiritual life, it's not the same thing. It's mm. not the same thing as 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 meditating. It's I think the difference is that one of one of them is sort of additive and the other is more subtractive. Like when I'm meditating, I'm subtracting everything. And what's left there is what's real for me. And, you know, sometimes what's left there like is, is Jewish prayer, but Mm. it's not like, it's not like me opening a book and, and sort of like 
infusing that language into my experience. Like I think I think the experience of peeling back and seeing what's underneath is very different than than, you know, like uh, sort of evoking a, an external kind of energy um, or an external reality through religious text or like I, I just think it's different. Mm. Um, I think framing is absolutely right. And I think that if you're leaving your heart outside of the experience, then the entirety of you is not in it. If your mind is in it and your heart is not, then, you know, it's, it's, it's what you're saying. It's, it's sort of like, there's a missing piece. Um, Reality is experiential. Reality is experiential. It's not just the trajectory of atoms to space. It's what we experience every day. Right. That's the main thing. And I think pretending like it's not, science can guide it and can build things to accompany a better life. But I, I definitely am becoming more and more aware the older I get that how important it is to not just think about, again, the nuts and bolts. It's not enough to know how to fix things or understand how they work. It's also important how you treat your world, uh, immediate bubble and more external bubble, like the people in it, because it gives rise to a different kind of technology you would want to build. If you think that only building this thing is important and understanding it, you will build it, but it would not have all the components that take into account people's experience. Again, I, this example I gave, like creating a car that is not just the, 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 you know, the skeleton, but actually a very comfortable car to sit in. Yeah. You know, it's a Tesla that is also amazing and fast and green, but also it's awesome and it's comfortable. Like mm -hmm. the, that's, I, I think, so I, I would love to explore more yeah. when we do another episode but I, I genuinely, I'm interested in what you mean by it's different. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I have I so think much more to say, but there. I also want to hear Aaron's take on yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, no, no, but I that, would that's love a really to talk interesting. About this. Uh, so, Aaron, you you also came from the basically from the Jewish tradition. Yes. And then you discovered this more appropriate way for yourself to explore this domain, and you basically made also some of it uh, your life's work, or at least cur your current life's work. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see this unfolding into the future as far as like, how do you see that, what you do developing, but also, and I don't know if you're going to have enough time to get into that, but if you have a little bit, I would love to hear it. Um, how do you see your personal growth, actually you, Aaron, actually changing w by making those decisions to look at the world this way? Do you, do you feel that there's like a radical change for you as a person? Um, there's a lot of stuff in there. I, I just wanted to frame it in terms of the, the Jewish upbringing because it was a large part of my Jewish upbringing that made me um, ask all these questions that led to that initial awakening experience. Like, I wanted to know, because I, I studied all this stuff when I was a kid, right? And learned Hebrew, studied Torah, I know prayers by heart still. And at a certain point, um, like, around college, uh, I was like, why, why did I do all this? Like, is there any reason that I have all this information? Like, I have all these, like, passages in my head and stories from the Bible and this kind of thing. And so I wanted to know if any of that was actually useful or if it was just, like, some kind of garbage thing. Uh, so I went out and they did these explorations, and I, I, I feel like the real learning process for people in understanding the world is to, like, look back at yourself, right? I don't personally feel like you can get the same level of understanding uh, by reading a book as you can uh, maybe like you read the book for context, but then you, you go and you do the experiment like with yourself, like you're the scientist, you're the experiment, like that's, that's the realm that we live in. Um, so once I started doing these things and I started having these experiences where I was tapping into this stuff that maybe like was sort of pointed at through the texts, I was like, okay, this is a much better way of understanding it. Like, let me just dive into it and go experience it firsthand. And then you start to see that, yeah, like all these religions and ways of describing things, they're sort of like, they're, they're, just, they're just interpretations of people that have been there and seen it. And then in certain situations, like I think with uh, certain sects of Judaism, it becomes a dogma and it becomes something that people follow just because someone told them that you're supposed to follow it, right? I'm not keeping kosher because it gives my body a certain feeling like I'm respecting it. It's just because the rabbi said, like, don't eat this and don't eat that. So really for me, um, the evolution was kind of away from all of these like structures of learning that are kind of like prescribed and people saying like, 
this is how it is and this is the way it's supposed to be and don't abandon these things because they're important and it's tradition and everyone's done it for millions or hundreds of years or whatever. Um, it really was this process of going deeper and understanding for myself what was real. And then as I was exploring personally, like I found connection in like Taoism and some of the tantric like explanations that, that just fit more with the actual experience that I was having. But it was still like, I'm not going to go tie myself to these traditions. It's just like, oh yeah, someone had a perspective and they were able to describe it. So I mean, that, that's the evolution for me is just this place where you have more internal freedom, right? So all of these ways of thinking that have been kind of like imposed on you, it creates a certain a certain structure that it, it's like, oh my, I can't eat this thing or I can't do this thing because it's bad because someone's told me it's that like, let me get to the point where I can feel into my body so clearly that it's like, I know that I don't want to eat this particular substance because it's, it's not good for my I body. I understand why. Yeah. 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 And that, that's, that's a very clear and concise answer. So thank you for that. That what I'm hearing you saying is that the difference is knowing why things should be a certain way and not another way for you personally and even collectively is very different than just following a command or a rule that somebody told you. Right. And like you said, there's a, it's very different than reading a book about skydiving and skydiving. Mm -hmm. There's a, two very different things. There's, there's things that you learn about the world skydiving that sitting and reading a book about it will never yeah. deliver to you. And I feel like those domains are even more so because they're so uh, uniquely outside of our daily perspective. They touch on so many elements that uh, have has the potential to either propel us to infinite bliss or infinite hell. Mm -hmm. So understanding the mechanisms that are involved here, in a real sense, they're way more important than, you know, than really than anything else because our world is experiential. It's not anything else. Um, so that's uh, that's brilliant. Thank you. Um, I will uh, end this very, very short episode of Dengo Thoughts because usually this is a full episode for you guys, but for me, this is like we're just warming up. Aww. So if you guys want, and we have a little bit more time, uh, if you guys have a little bit more time, even though I know that you're leaving for school yeah. for at least a year, right? For at least a year. But, but if I, you, I will be visiting. Yeah, be if, we, if, if you'll be visiting and your schedule is not going to be too tight, I would love to do this again and we actually take the time and like really unpack our personal journeys. Yeah, and we can also do it journeys. while I'm in New York if you're down. Like I can just I'm set down. Oh, I'm bringing a setup. Oh, I'm down. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll 100%. do that. 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, so there's, much a, there's more, a lot of avenues here that I think so that needs to be explored. There's so much more to unpack here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so again, I want to thank you deeply for coming and being gracious with your attention and time and openness and skepticism because that's really, really important to me. So uh, I'm very glad that Scott introduced us thank and you. I'm very happy to call you guys my friends. Uh, so good luck in school. Thank you. And yeah. we'll and uh, good luck with all the possible. It's it's weird to say good luck because we're still in the same city. We can hang out and stuff. <laughs> but um, yeah, I appreciate you guys very much, and I think that you guys' journey is going to culminate in something incredible for not just yourselves but the rest of the world because I can see the the alignments happening here i am you employing the woo woo language <laughs> but uh hey not it not everybody can score guests like strassman and in, in, the, in the first couple of episodes okay so that's that's something <laughs> that's something to uh to note me too um so thank you guys and uh i would love to do this again sometimes very soon thank you so much for having us absolutely yeah.